I've used a lot of small form factor machines over the years, from the Raspberry Pi to cheap eBay thin clients. And all of them have their ups and downs. So today I'm looking at the Zima board self-described single board server, an x86 based small form factor single board PC. This has some features that make it a good choice for budget or low power home labs, especially the software I like to run such as Proxmox or OpenSense. In full disclosure, Icewale did send me the Zima board 832 free of charge. No money changed hands and they will not see this until after you guys do. So let's get started on this. So let's see what we got in the box. Looks pretty tiny. Oh, oh, he's got stiff at first. Checks out okay. So uh, here is the unit itself. Fits in my hand. I was not expecting it in my hand, which means it can't be that much bigger than the Raspberry Pi. This looks like a power adapter. It says 12 volt, three amps. That's 36 watts. It's quite the, uh, quite the flower. And the unit itself. Man, this thing is tiny. I thought this was going to be way bigger. I guess I should have anticipated based on the specs, but uh, yeah. So we got power jack, dual gigabit, dual USB 3, mini display port, PCI Express Gen 2 by 4, and it's cut out in the back so you can put in a full size card. We got this cable which has two SATA and one power. And they include a cable that does one SATA and one power. So you might have a hard time using the second port. So let's chat about specs here. Model I have in my hand is the Zima board 832, which is the highest end model retails for 200 bucks. The eight means there's eight gigs of RAM. It's DDR4 soldered on board. The 32 means there are 32 gigs of EMMC also soldered on board. Lineup has two other models, the $120 216 with two gigs of RAM and 16 gigs of EMMC and the mid tier $160 432, four gigs of RAM and 32 gigs of EMMC. The low end model has a dual core CPU. The other two models have a quad core. Other than that, the IO specs are the same. The CPU in this guys is an Intel Celeron Atom Lake. So that is part of the high end Atom generation, not the low end core. So it's the power efficient, um, no hyper threading Atom family. There is an integrated Intel GPU in this guys. It can do Intel QuickSync with H.264 and H.265 encoding. If you want to do any media encoding and Jellyfin. Marketing claims this thing is a hackable computer, but that's a bit dubious. I did tear it apart. Bottom is just some laser cut acrylic panels. It's pretty easy to take apart. But when you take the top heatsink off, which is a uh, metal by the way, I'm not sure what metal, but uh, it comes off. Um, there's literally nothing inside you can touch. There's only a few connectors or headers on the board. One is labeled CPU fan. There's one labeled 12 volt. There's one labeled LPC debug and one labeled panel, but there's no descriptions for any of these anywhere. So. Don't plan on using them for any GPIO. PCIe slot is also a little bit awkward. This particular card heater won't go in because the uh, slot bracket hits the case. So I gotta take the slot bracket off. And also this has a nice enclosure, but when you put a card on the side, it just kind of looks kind of jank to me. Um, which is perfectly fine if you just wanna test cards in a test bench like I do. I got open air stuff all day. But if you wanna make like a nice enclosed uh, home lab, you're kinda gonna ruin the look when you start adding cards to it. With that said, let's see what the included Casa OS is like, even though I don't plan on using Casa OS myself. It's got two Ethernet ports. Which one should I pick? Which one do you want to pick? He sniffed the right one. There we go. It's coming up now. Debian GNU Linux. So looks like it has a GUI pre-installed, which looks suspiciously like Debian's standard GUI, um, which is perfectly fine. That's a great operating system to base off. There's also web UI, which I'll flip over to look at. Probably a reminder, it is open source and uh, you're welcome to install it on your own hardware. And they officially support Raspberry Pi. So if you're into that thing and uh, yeah. Drag an icon to sort. Okay, so let's see what the app store looks like. Oh boy. It's got Home Assistant, I love Home Assistant. Add Guard Home, also love that one. Jellyfin, huge fan. Photo Prism, I have never used it, but I'm sure you guys will tell me to make a video about it. Um, if you like Sailing the Seven Seas, they have all the R apps. Um, yeah, so let's see what it's like to install one of these.
That's pretty quick. Why are you at 172.17? That is not right. Oh, hmm. Ah, they're doing something with Docker. That's the Docker network. Another reason I hate Docker, Docker messes with networking too much. It took me right back here. So I'm connected via the IPv6 address. IPv6 works perfectly fine on Cos OS, but it seems like they're not bridging IPv6 into the Docker network normally, which is a relatively normal Docker problem. I don't think it's their fault. It's probably Docker's fault. Yeah, so there's a Docker image at pull. It's trying to bridge it on... Does that mean it'll work on v6 now? No, there's no v6 Docker network. So anyway, you're learning in real time why I don't like Docker. Um, not the fault of Casa OS, I don't, I don't think. My experience with Docker has been pretty similar. The networking, especially IPv6, is just a gigantic nightmare in Docker. So if you're into some basic stuff, this will do it. So as for file sharing, it gets a little more complicated. So the box doesn't really have much, I mean, it has enough storage for an OS. If you're running Home Assistant, it's got plenty for that. If you're running a router like OpenWRT or OpenSense, 32 gigs is fine, 16 gigs is fine. Um, if you want like general file storage, you're gonna have to add some storage. And there are two SATA ports, but there isn't really a box to like put them in. It's not very neat. It's about all I can say about Casa OS. It is functional. If you want Home Assistant, if you want basics like that, it will definitely do it. I am going to wipe it now and I'm going to install OpenSense and do some router testing. So I sat through a full OpenSense install and recorded the whole thing, but then I realized it's completely normal. There's literally nothing different about installing OpenSense on this versus any other board. I booted up, went into the installer, ran it, and it worked just fine. No issues. These are Realtek-based NICs, but the driver was included in the latest release of OpenSense, and I didn't have any problems in testing. So since a really cool feature of this thing is the PCIe slot, I'm going to try it with some cards I have. First up, I have a Mellanox Connect X4 25 gig card. I'm only gonna try this at 10 gig because I don't have any other 25 gig cards. But this should draw a decent amount of power and we'll see if it can hold up to the PCIe 2.0 by four bandwidth. For a little bit more intense test, I have a Radeon Pro WX3100. This is a pretty low end GPU. As you can see, it's single slot half light, but it's bus powered. This will see if it can power low power bus power cards. I know it's Hoping this is within the 30 watts of the power supply, but I guess we'll figure that out. For both these tests, I'm using Ubuntu 22.04 LTS release. I have USB ports for a keyboard and a mouse because I have my Ventoy thumb drive. So I guess I'll do install from keyboard only. installed Ubuntu. If you're curious about the LS CPU, LS PCI, all that good stuff, link down in the description below to the blog post. It's all that good stuff. I'm playing uh, Sintel Blender Open Movie Release and uh, does not do it at 4K. If you're curious about if it does 4K playback, that's a no. This one's encoded in VP9. I tried the same file encoded in H.264 and it didn't like that one either. So um, some of that could be VLC not automatically detecting QuickSync video or QuickSync video not coming out correctly. But 1440p seems about the limit of what it could do video wise. Um, it's getting pretty toasty doing this, but uh, I was not expecting this much from a low power CPU like this, but it's actually quite warm. Um, I can hold my hand on it, but it's something to be aware of if you're doing anything intense that uh, it does get hot and it needs that aluminum heat sink here. Not sure if it's aluminum. Whatever metal it is, it needs metal. So, how about PCI cards?
onto the uh, Mellanox Connect X4. So with this card in, driver came up, both network cards showed, I configured it for a link local, connect to my desktop, iPerf is happy. LSPCI shows link cap of 8 giga transfers per second by 8 lanes. So that'd be PCI Gen 3 by 8, that's what the card is capable of. And link stat or link status says 5 giga transfers downgraded and X4 downgraded, so it's running at PCI Gen 2 by 4, as it should. So it seems like this saw does work as expected. Let's try a higher power card, the Radeon. card in. I got the onboard graphics hooked up to this monitor, the Radeon card hooked up to that monitor. Got no monitors left for my desktop, but that's okay. Now the red light came on, so hopefully it boots. Fan is spinning up, that's a good sign. I feel like this is not the intended use case for this little board, um, but I guess we'll figure that out. Oh my god, <laughs> look at that. So I saw some other reviews of this that said they couldn't get any graphics cards to work. I think you just need to have a really low power graphics card to get both these working. Look, Ubuntu automatically figured out my screen layout. Well, right on top found Polaris 12. That's what this is. What about Heaven? Should we run Heaven? So I moved you guys a bit so you can see both monitors. So on this side I have Radeon on top, which is the external GPU. On this side I have Intel GPU top, which is the iGPU, and we're going to run Heaven and see which GPU it picks. I guess we can't see Radeon on top anyway, but uh, pick that. Okay, we flipped. Top on that side, Heaven on this side. Looks like it's also hammering the Intel iGPU, so getting iGPU levels of performance. But it works. So this little tiny GPU does work just fine. So that basically means to me, as long as I don't exceed the 36 watt power limit of that power brick for both the mini PC and the PCIe card, I should be okay. So it doesn't mean you can run something like um, a Tesla P4 or something. Um, those use like 70 watts out of the PCI slot, but uh, decently powered cards should be okay. And there's nothing inherently wrong with running a GPU on this other than the power limit. So where do we go from here? If we don't limit ourselves to the built-in software, which is honestly not bad, at least in my opinion, it could be worse. Um, there's a lot of things that can run on this. Being an x86 board, we can run basically anything like Proxmox, OpenSense, OpenWRT, all that good stuff, no limits. Whatever your project goals are, this can probably run the software you're already used to. Obviously, routing comes to mind when you have a dual NIC device, thinking a LAN port and a WAN port. That just makes sense, right? There's plenty of other use cases for dual NIC that aren't as commonly thought about. For example, if you want to run a network video recorder with Frigate, you could have one port connected to your LAN and the other port connected to all your cameras on their own isolated network without using VLANs or any of that kind of stuff. Another example I've thought of recently is a lot of like um, CNC machines. We use Ethernet based control, and in that case, you could have one Ethernet dedicated to the machine's internal network. You could use legacy IPv4 and not have to bother your LAN with all of these high priority machine control packets. So for me, I'm using this as a test bench. As part of what I do on YouTube, I tend to test a lot of things. And so having a little thing that has PCIe and SATA, Ethernet, that's just generally useful to me. Anytime I get in a new device I'm trying to test, I can plug it into this thing. It's easy to handle. I can leave it on my desk. That's what I'm using it for. If you're interested in seeing whatever projects I'm gonna come up with for this, don't forget to like and subscribe. You can find my link to my Discord below. You can chat me through there if you got any ideas. I'd love to hear about them. And as always, I'll see you guys on the next adventure.